Hello, 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 and welcome to another edition of Heavy Hands. I'm your host, Connor Rebush. With me, as always, Phil McKenzie. Yo. Yo, Phil, and yo to our audience who join us on a momentous occasion. Eight years ago, a young man by the name of William Muhammad better known as Billy, debuted in the UFC. And he told us something. He said, remember my name, folks. Now, a lot of people didn't remember his name. Including, Dan- including Daniel Cormier. Uh, when Very he won- true, yes. <laughs> when he won the welterweight title. <laughs> but folks, I remembered the name. Phil remembered the name. And now he's the fucking champion. That's right. UFC 304, Bilal Muhammad, Leon Edwards. Um, and I'm just very pleased, Phil, that I made the deliberate tactical decision to pick against him. Um, because as you reminded me before we started, what happened uh, last time he fought Leon Edwards is that I picked him. Yep. And then he lost, and I realized the power that was in my hands. Hmm. And so, because I, I not only remembered, but cherished his name all this time, and I had yearned to see him reach the top of the mountain, I made a very deliberate decision to pick incorrectly that he would lose to Leon Edwards. And uh, I think the results uh, speak for themselves. Yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah, uh, uh, other people, other people didn't might do their part. Say that you pushed out. Well, other people didn't do their part, did that's, they? Other people just sort of left it up to uh, chance. Uh, there'd been some of us who'd been carrying the Bilal remember the name Mohammed torch for a while, <laughs> and that they were still believing in him, and that some people had lost their belief in Bilal remember the name Mohammed. <laughs> some people picked actually picked him to win this fight, and. As I was watching him fairly soundly win this fight, I found myself thinking, why did Connor pick against him? <laughs> what is it that makes Connor, like, made Connor abandon him so easily, so lightly? Is it the long standing antipathy between the sports teams? Presumably the, uh, what even are they? The Cubs and the Reds? Oh, is it I that? Don't... I don't think anyone cares about the Reds. Is it, <laughs> is it a hatred of deep dish pizza and everything it represents? Or is it something darker? <laughs> something more significant? <laughs> As deep down, Connor really hate people with huge fucking heads. Well, now listen. Just, just if you're looking at him saying, look at the size of that guy's noggin. He's got, can't not have a few bad thoughts floating around in there. Now, Phil, you've only met me in person once. Mm-hmm. I still hesitate to think that it's possible for you to have forgotten the size <laughs> of my head, which occupied no less than three of London's boroughs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the screams and cries of people yes. who made their way through London. Yes. Uh, yeah, particularly all the Japanese tourists had, you know, very wide eyes and looks of terror on their faces, some sort of genetic memory <laughs> that they were experiencing seeing the shadow of my dome, um, covering, uh, boy, I wish I could think of a single London borough. Give me one. Help me out here. Piccadilly? Yeah, that, that one. That was where we met, right? Somewhere yeah. We were Shading there. Piccadilly. We ate Vietnamese food. I remember that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I they were referring to you as Craniomond. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you're accusing me of self-hatred <laughs> that, okay well fair enough but it doesn't extend to Bilal <laughs> I still love Bilal and um, I will say you know if you had the thought why did Connor pick against him um, I also had that thought not even it, well before the fight was even over because 
it's it's a common refrain, Phil, after a fight that it is like a lot of um one sided fights feel like conspiracies, right? Mm-hmm. It's one fighter's virtues teaming up with the other fighter's vices. You know, one guy has a shitty performance, one guy has a great performance. So often that is the case. Never more so than in this fight. And so I I feel that it's very funny to say this because obviously I picked it wrong, uh, which I'm very good at. But in hindsight, useless as that is, this feels like one of the most predictably one-sided fights ever. Like, um, uh, like RDA Pettis. Like, have, once you saw RDA Pettis, another huge dominant mm-hmm. upset, once you saw that fight, you would never pick it wrong again. <laughs> I know it's useless at that point, but once you see it, you're like, oh, of course, RDA beats Pettis. Look at how their styles match up. And in this fight, it's like, okay, so the game plan, you know, that thing that Bilal Muhammad's really good at, he might mess up his game plan sometimes, but you give him a second crack you should be pretty confident he's going to come up with the right idea. And the game plan was really very simple. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Get him to the fence, Mm -hmm. wrestle him, keep the pressure on. Don't respect him. And knowing how Leon Edwards responds to that, knowing that Bilal Muhammad will be capable of sticking to this game plan for five rounds – it really shouldn't have been a leap of the imagination to uh, to conceive of Bilal winning exactly the way he did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, that's why I went on a giant rant last, last episode. Yeah. Where, at the beginning of it, where I was like, I cannot understand why everyone is so confident that Leon Edwards is going to win this. You were 100% because... right. It's just like... Yeah, and seeing it playing out, it's like, of course, this is the fight that happened. It was what I, I was doubting Bilal's ability to be like, oh, I'm gonna like swarm this student pressure. I've seen him do that nine times when it's the right mm-hmm. call to make. Was well, yeah, I? So I think that's why it's different to, um, that's why it's different to like RDA Pettis because, and why it's like a a less pickable fight in a rematch than perhaps this one was, right? Yeah. Um. Because RDA Pettis is an entirely uh, organic result of who those two guys are. Anthony Pettis is just never beating RDA unless he head kicks him. Yes. And because RDA is naturally a pressurer and he's naturally going to want to pressure someone who fights like Anthony Pettis. Yeah. The difference between this one is that this was a style matchup which was in many ways, nightmarish for Bilal. Because yes. it was someone who can beat him up in the clinch. It's a long, rangy, dangerous southpaw. Uh, it's someone who can just boot him in his aforementioned giant head. Um, it was really, yeah, it was, it was a genuinely uh, tough start matchup on paper. And, yeah, one that we'd seen him struggling badly in before. Yes. Um, you know, we hadn't seen RDA and Pettis fight, and we hadn't seen, uh, like, Pettis just... Just like thumping him round the cage for the better part of yes, uh, you know, a round or two. Uh, but yeah, that, that, but that is what makes Bilal remember the name Muhammad so incredibly impressive as a fighter. I mean, I don't think, I don't honestly at this point, I don't think there's anyone I can think of in maybe MMA history who is a better game planner. No, might be someone who is. Who is more likely to be in a situation where you're like, this fighter should approach this fight in this way. And, you know, you always have to give that, the, you almost always have to give that the caveat of that, of, but they're not going to do it because yeah. they're an MMA fighter. With Bilal, you can be actually fairly confident that he is going to do it, that yes. he is going to fight that fight in exactly the right way, with exactly the right directionality that he should. He's fought back foot counterpunching performances, he's fought wrestling heavy performances, he's fought striking heavy performances, uh, he's fought mixtures, like, and yeah, there's just been 
his, his ability to adapt his game plan is, is just is literally second to none. It really is, yeah. Because it's not the it's not the difficulty of conceiving of, of the uh, game literally plan. Literally anyone, including Volkanovsky, including GSP, yeah. uh, literally anyone. Guys who were and guys who are physically, you know, far more impressive and potent than than he is. Yeah, that is his superpower. That's what I mean. And, like the yeah. game, the game plan is not particularly complicated for beating Leon Edwards. Yeah. And once you see it start to click, that's what I mean. It's like, of course, look how well this is mm-hmm. working. Of course, it works. It's B- Bilal's unique ability is to stick doggedly to four or five sort of broadly defined different ways of approaching a fight. That is the thing mm-hmm. other MMA fighters can't do. They might hit upon the game plan. I bet Leon Edwards had a game plan for this fight. Mm-hmm. I bet it didn't look like that. <laughs> he, yeah. Other fighters just can't mold themselves as freely as Bilal Muhammad can. He's so flexible in his approach and then so determined to stick to the game plan that works for him. He can't be put off once he realizes he's on the right track. Yeah. Even before this, before this fight happened, I've, I've still been thinking about, you know, I haven't written anything in MMA for a while. I'm thinking some, writing something about Bilal Muhammad, just to, like calling him the exploiter or something, because, you know, this is why people have this antipathy towards him, because he's like, it reminds me of like, uh, a game I used to play. I used to play like Devil May Cry 3. And this is a like super flashy, silly action game, right? Mm-hmm. And there's, a point in that game where you have to fight like a, a giant millipede or something and it flies through the air and it's really annoying. And the best way to fight it is to like stand in one corner and shoot it with the sniper rifle over and over again. Yeah. To, you cheese it. In a game which is, yeah, in a game which is otherwise meant to be super exciting. Um, but it, it's a hor- it's a horrible fight and you just want to get it over with. Blal is going to do that for every single fight. It cheeses everybody. He finds a, yeah, if he finds a way to win, he will do it. Yeah. And what this means is that, and he will do it over and over again. And what this means is that he will often make people look bad. And will it will frequently make the fight look bad as a result. Mm-hmm, exactly. I mean, so as I said, like last time, you know, we were balancing Leon Edwards, you know, sort of clinical. Uh, wins, clinical but somewhat close ish mm-hmm. wins over old Colby and old Usman, uh, which were uh, considered to be, you know, far, just in a different league to Bilal's, uh, much more dominating wins over old Gilbert Burns and old Wonderboy. Yeah. And, you know, young but not very good Sean Brady. Um, but, like, uh, that's the thing, is that before, and for that matter, Vicente Luque. But the thing is, before, like, three, out, at least three out of those four fights, a lot of people, including us, were like, man, these are really tough matchups for Bilal Mohamed. Right. Like, Wonderboy Thompson, a huge, incredibly mobile southpaw, how is he going to track him down? Really easily, as it turned out. Yeah. Like, Gilbert Burns, Gilbert Burns is just going to physically overpower him. He's going to out, he's going to out punch him in the pocket. Um, he's an incredibly good grappler. Bilal's not going to be able to out-wrestle him. And as it turns out, Bilal just beat him quite handily, even before the shoulder, mm-hmm. before the, the his shoulder went out. You know, Vicente Luque, again, in the rematch, he just beat him really easily. So uh, there'd been enough, like, nightmare matchups that Bilal had just solved so completely that after the fight people were just like well the guy's shit now Mm -hmm. that people were still just being like oh it's just another nightmare matchup for Bilal Bilal Muhammad Mm -hmm. like he can adapt his way around almost any matchup that's the most impressive thing about him it really is incredible but it is you know it is in fact one of the most impressive things I've kind of seen in this sport yeah He's just a winner, man. And Leon Edwards is a loser. And it, uh, <laughs> you know, it speaks to, it really speaks to, I think, the tremendous impact that athletic ability has 
that Leon Edwards has lost, um, less in the last 10 years than Bilal Muhammad. Mm-hmm. Because Bilal Muhammad is, he's not an athlete on Leon Edwards level. And you could even see that at points in this fight. But Leon is out there having fights that should not be close, letting people he's completely dominated back into the fight uh, routinely, and yet he was just not quite losing for such a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it just took, uh, yeah. I, I found this, and, and, and another thing I will say, and I, some people did disagree with me. Look, a lot of people, particularly in the audience, they were booing Bilal. They're mad. They're booing when he was mm-hmm. wrestling Leon. Like, boo, don't win. Um, I thought this was actually a fun Bilal Muhammad fight. Yeah. When the, when the game plan happens to be fun and also is the right call, Bilal is more than capable of being fun. That Sean Brady fight was a blast too. Well, there was fans also booing when uh, Leon backpacked him for an entire round. No, curiously, <laughs> they yeah. curiously they were not. Um, but yeah, that you know, like I, I thought this was a pretty fun fight. Like super yeah. intense pressure uh, from Bilal, just like eating shots from Leon at points and just refusing to take a backward step. You know, just sticking to it. And it, when the approach requires that kind of pressure and intensity, uh, as I think you see here, I'm not saying this was the greatest barn burner of all time, but this was a solid, entertaining uh, fight with uh, mm-hmm. with enough little surprises and momentum swings to keep it compelling, uh, and also just enough to make it incredibly frustrating if you had any hopes whatsoever for Leon Edwards. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's talk about that. We've, we've, we've glazed Bilal Muhammad. Not enough, but we will have plenty of opportunities, uh, in the days and weeks to come. I will never have enough of shitting on Leon Edwards, however. And <laughs> that was a big part of this. Uh, as I said, that was a huge part of this was Bilal's virtues conspiring with Leon's vices. Did this give you any new perspective, any new insight into what exactly is fucking wrong with Leon Edwards? Not really, just that he is... He's going to be... Uh, like I, I, think it, it really, I think you really just nailed it a while back, is that he's extremely comf- he's extremely uncomfortable in certain areas of the fight. Yeah. And if he's if he's stuck in those areas, then he just goes he just goes passive and or he gets hit. Yeah. Like I mean there's a reason there's obviously like a reason why he's uh you know a why he's scared of being in the pockets because he's been clipped there loads of times. Sure. You know, by by often not particularly amazing fighters like old Nate Diaz or Brian Barberena. Yep. Um, but yeah, his his reaction is simply to throw like one, maybe two strikes to scare the other guy out off, and then just skirt back. Similarly, his grappling game is, you know, strong defensive wrestling, a dangerous clinch. But, um, you know, Bilal was able to, like, pull his hands up and then essentially, like, go for crotch lift takedowns and, yeah, kind of, and also break his posture by pushing him back into the fence. So it was just sort of, you know, we saw this with, like, it's seen in much more extreme examples in other fights, like, you know, Edson Barboza, Giga Chikadze on this card. Mm Mm-hmm. Where it was just like, here's the zone where I can hit you. And Arnold Allen kept moving into that zone more and more, or moving past that zone mm-hmm. more accurately. And uh, Giga just kept having to try and like move away faster and faster to try and regain it. And that was that was it, is that like Bilal just sat himself in the pocket the entire time. Yep. And 
Leon was just like, man, I hate it here. Why won't he leave? He fits. Just go away. Yeah, I can't, I can't clinch up with him. And I'm not just like sniping him from a mile away. Somebody on, on Twitter, um, said, uh, in passing, uh, in a reply to me, and I found this to be quite mean, but also quite accurate. They characterized Leon's performance in this fight as pouty. Mm. Which it, it kind of is when he's losing. Like the first Kamaru fight is the same feeling, isn't it? He's like petulant. Like, mm-hmm. stop. He's just like mad and like annoyed that the guy won't stop beating him. But he doesn't do anything mm-hmm. proactively to stop it. This is the thing. This is my new insight into Leon Edwards. Um, all of that, this was just further confirmation of that that is both a psychological and connected to that technical gap in Leon's game. But the thing that really stood out to me here, seeing him have to deal with that problem area over and over and over again, is that he's lazy. And I don't mean he has no work ethic. I'm not saying he doesn't work hard. Uh, I'm not saying he doesn't get himself into tremendous shape, you know, that he doesn't uh, train really diligently and diet. Like, he's not lazy in that sense. He's conceptually lazy. And I think this goes back to the old idea of why superior athletes so often do not develop the technical depth of guys like Bilal Muhammad, who, by the way, I said we were done glazing him, but we're going to talk about his boxing in a minute. Which he hilariously said was like, he was like Canelo Alvarez, which of course I snorted when I heard that. But frankly, keep in mind, this was a Bilal Muhammad Southpaw boxing performance. Yep. And it was marked by his lead hand work more than anything else. So we are going to talk about that because that's a huge growth, um, and a new angle to enhance Bilal's strategic flexibility that he's now able to do that too. But, uh, yeah. The thing that struck me is that Leon is conceptually lazy. He, he gets into uncomfortable positions and his instinct is to kind of smudge the lines of what you're supposed to do and just sort of hope the opponent doesn't punish him for it. There's one particular move which occurs again and again and again in this fight. It's like at least eight occasions where Bilal gets his back to the fence. And Leon does not like it. And he wants to get out. Okay, how do you get out? You got a circle. Now, if you were a proactive fighter, if you were interested in maintaining control and being diligent, if you thought of fighting the way Bilal Muhammad does, you would probably be, either you'd be really, look, if you didn't have good technique to circle or pivot, if that just wasn't in your wheelhouse, you would like rush it, right? You'd be like, now's my chance and you'd go. Leon doesn't do that. He's lazy in that sense where he just kind of drift out of range and time and again, Bilal would just walk him down and hit him when he was trying to escape. But the other thing is that technically he is smudging the lines. Uh, okay. So this is the situation I'm talking about. He's backed up to the fence. Bilal Mahad's pressuring him. He's right in front of him. Leon has to circle. What he should do is pivot on his front foot. That's how you get your back off the, off the wall. You pivot on your front foot so that you keep the lead hand between you and the opponent. That is essential. That's how you control the space between yourself and the opponent. Any other type of movement, if you turn your back, if you sidestep and open up your stance, you are sacrificing your control of the center of the space between you and your opponent. That's why you pivot and keep your jab as a barrier. But Leon doesn't do that. Instead, he just sort of decides, I'm going to move to the side now. Sometimes he reaches out and tries to cover Bilal's lead hand. Sometimes he literally just, he takes a step back out of his southpaw stance, either squaring up or like shifting backwards into orthodox and tries to just shuffle away big wide circle. And every single time this would happen, he gave up control, made it free, basically, for Bilal to take a big adjustment step to cut him off. 
because what's he have to worry about? You can do all the footwork you want right in front of dude if he's not in position. And every time he ate either multiple jabs, a left hook, or a left uppercut from Bilal. Every time he tried to lazily circle to his right, ah, I don't need to keep my jab between him. I'm just going to kind of, he's not going to come after me, is he? Why would he? I'm Leon Edwards. I'll nail him. And Bilal punished him for it every time. This is what this performance really was, is that these are mistakes Leon makes habitually. And Bilal is the first guy I have ever seen not let him get away with any of them. Not one. Every single time Leon gave up control of that distance between them, gave opened up his center line, Bilal was on him. And it was always the left hand. That's what really struck me, is Leon getting into uncomfortable positions and essentially trying to cheat his way out of them, rather than being diligent, rather than staying locked in and focused. And and again, this is the age-old conundrum with Leon. How much of this is because he doesn't have the technical understanding? How much of it is because he just doesn't like being there and he and he he doesn't he doesn't want to have to um you know like confront himself with dealing with the situation he's in? I don't know, bit of both probably. But time and again, he just made a very lazy decision and got punished for it. This happened in the clinches too. He was really lazy about fighting the hands, for example. Whenever Bilal got on a rear waist cinch or a body lock. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got dumped on his fucking head for it. He spends like 30 seconds not fighting the hands, just kind of leaning against the cage. Very lackadaisical. And he's like, all right, I guess I'll attack the grip. And then Bilal switched his grip immediately and crotch high crotches him and dumps him on his head. Uh, that was what really stood out to me in this fight and has sort of recolored the way I view Leon's whole career is that a lot of these moments where he loses control and lets his opponent back into the fight, it is because they suddenly realize, oh, it's free to do something to him right now. I can just step in and do mm -hmm. something. It's free. Sometimes this yeah. takes the form of him, uh, trying to, to like time a counter on like raw reaction time. No setup, no feint. He's just like stands in front of the opponent. They move and he's like, I'm going to counter him. That's how the Barbarena knockdown happens. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't do any positional work to make the counter he's going for work. He just thinks I'm fast. He's going to step in. I'm going to nail him and he gets punished for that. But so all of these moments sort of have that flavor of Leon just kind of not bothering to do something right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think... He's not principled. That's slaughter. the word I'm looking for. Unprincipled is is the yeah. way that Leon fights. And that and Bilal Muhammad is nothing if not principled as a fighter. Win, win, win. Yeah. I think a... Um, yeah, I think a certain degree of sort of arrogance about, you know, your fighting style being the best is probably necessary sure. for many top fighters. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to... Because this can also be, you know, you can sort of com you can compare that sort of petulance to, like, people like Robbie Lawler, right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, like, there's parts of the fight which I like. Yes. There's parts of it which just suck. Which... I'm just going to sit here and look mad about them until they're over. Yeah. Um... And in many ways, you know, he's got less of those areas than, you know, Robbie Law did. And, uh, he's incredibly well-rounded, Leon Edwards. That's the thing. Yeah. 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 But that's the thing is that those, and that's why he's had such a successful career is that those, like, little gaps in his game are, they're, they're not obvious in the sort of, you know, strike this guy, wrestle this guy kind of way that, that so many MMA fighters still are. Yeah. Not even in a, they're not even in a, a even a, a kind of pressure this guy kind of way, because, you know, doing that will just get you, doing that stupidly will just get you into the clinch and it will just get you taken down by him. Yeah. Uh, and it will run you onto counter shots. Yeah. But no, the approach. This was a pressure performance where, yeah, Bilal just sat in the empty space in Leon's game and he just sat in it for pretty much the entire fight. Yep. And it really, encouraged Leon to make those lazy decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. And it 
and cur- and it put him in a position to be the one to punish them whenever they were made. Yeah. Again, I'm I'm not when I say lazy, I want to make it clear. I'm not saying that I think I think this is a kind of laziness that all elite competitors want to be able to do. Like you don't want to be mm-hmm. like fully who who is a fighter who can be or any kind of like single athletic competition um there are no athletes who want to be fully like mentally engaged and thinking about everything the entire time you can't yeah like it's it's mentally exhausting all fighters want to have some catch all solutions you know uh if i think of i'm i'm about to make a chess comparison phil i apologize if you if you win a piece in chess, you know, you're up a piece, you're winning. You can play like a computer and find all the best moves. But also you can just trade all the pieces that are left. And a lot of times the computer is not going to make that decision, but it's a very practical decision. And there is a practical kind of laziness that I think is a good goal to aim for. If you're in this kind of competition, you want to be you want to be efficient with your mental energy. And not have to spend it where it's not required. If there's an easy solution, you want to make the easy solution so that you can expend your mental energies where it's really needed. Because your resources are limited. But Leon's game is full of these little lazy sort of half thought out moves and decisions. M- more so than others. And, and the empty space between them is filled less than other, than it is with other fighters. Um, but again, it's been a long time since Leon Edwards actually lost, mm-hmm. which really speaks to how difficult and unusual it is for a fighter like Bilal Muhammad to have such an ability to stick to the right game plan. There's a reason Leon gets away with all of this line smudging and rule breaking and unprincipled uh, fighting behavior, because most fighters can't convince themselves to be in a position to punish those mistakes consistently. And uh, shit, Bilal had to eat some nasty shots and he had to get his back taken at one point. Like this is the other thing why Leon doesn't lose. He has access to a kind of desperate determination when he really needs it, uh, mm-hmm. which we have seen either help him to survive or pull out fights that have suddenly spiraled out of his control many, many times. Yeah. He's so it's got a tremendous depth of skill. Yeah. And, but also, like, he, he will go for it, you know? Yeah. Maybe not in the principled way you'd like, but he will go for it. And it usually is enough to hold things together. It's almost always enough to hold things together. Even when he's fighting someone like Kamaru Usman, a, a fighter, by the way, way better than Bilal Muhammad in so many ways. But who took his his eye off the ball in the fifth round of their uh, second fight, and that's why he got KO'd because <laughs> he relaxed. Mm-hmm. Bilal never relaxed, and that is something that m- just most fighters can't do. Never took his eye off the ball. Uh, final bit of praise for Bilal because uh, I really do think. Whatever criticisms you have of on Leon, you have to emphasize that nobody else has been able to do this, actually. Uh, not to completion. The final point of praise, Bilal's boxing was fire. Like, yeah. it was a really good anti-Southpaw boxing. Where did it come from? Practice. And he just fought Leon like he fights any fighter. He didn't do all the like anti Southpaw yep. stuff that he's tricked himself into doing in the past. Jabs, left yep. hooks, left hooks to the body. You know, like the right hand was mostly a setup for the shot. All the work yep. was the lead hand, and it was super effective. Yeah. He just threw his right hand in the trash where it belongs. That's right. And yeah, just had like a super versatile lead hand that yeah, constantly splitting the guard, coming up underneath it. Mm-hmm. That was great. And it was that all that lead hand work uh, was exactly why he made Leon's wrestling defense look so much worse than we know it really is. 
because he was getting incredibly clean entries on his double legs from very close range. And most of the time he got in on Leon's legs, Leon was like shelled up in a high guard because he didn't know what the hell was happening with all this lead hand action in his face. So again, everything is connected in this Bilal Muhammad approach. The wrestling would not have worked without the boxing. None of them would have worked without the commitment to pressure and middle distance and close range. Uh, it was just a comprehensive game plan and... I feel ashamed that I uh, doubted Bilal Muhammad's ability to deliver a comprehensive that. game plan because that is his thing. That's what makes him Bilal makes Muhammad. Sick. I, I know. <laughs> Look, I'll pick in favor of him next time, and he'll lose his first title defense. If that'll make you happy, okay? Oh, I was, I was, I was saying on, tw- I was saying on Twitter, like, uh, is that. Uh, like, this is like the, this is basically like the, the BJ Frankie of its day, right? Um, it's that, you know, one guy, you're just like, one guy's bigger, he's, you know, he's a really good anti-wrestler, he's, and everyone likes him more, he's more dynamic, mm-hmm. uh, he's looks technically cleaner in a lot of ways, and one guy's just a small, relentless workhorse that just overperforms expectations all the time. Yeah, that's a, that's a great comparison. And, uh, and then I was like, and what happened to, uh, like Frankie Edgar? Oh, he had the fights with Gray Maynard, admittedly. But then he fought someone who was just like four times his size. Yeah. And then Henderson and lost to him. So yeah, maybe I will think, uh, I will think carefully about whether I will be picking Bilal Mohammed over Shavkat Rachmanov, who is four times his size. Yeah, right. He's going to meet his Benson Henderson. Yeah. Either that or uh, he's going to lose. His first title defense will be to Patty Pimblett. <laughs> Finally forced to move up to welterweight where he's still five times bigger than all of his opponents. And he just beats Bilal by being big. That'll be good. To be a bantamweight. Insane. Yeah. All right. Well, I didn't even, we were so excited to talk about, uh, Muhammad Edwards and what a momentous upset and culmination of an incredible journey. Uh, for both guys in a way. This just feels like it was a long time coming for both guys. Leon losing to some dude and our favorite some dude actually winning a UFC title. It, it couldn't have been more perfect culmination to these two stories. Uh, but we were so excited to talk about it. I didn't even say what we were going to discuss for the rest of the episode. So now as we close out <laughs> segment one, I will say that, of course, we're going to talk about the rest of UFC 304, all the big stuff anyway. Tom Aspinall, Curtis Blades. That shouldn't take long. Patty Pimblett, King Green. Unfortunately, we'll be talking about that. Arnold Allen, Giga Chikadze. Um, there was a quite a bit to discuss here. And of course, next week, is um, a pretty solid fight night card, main evented by Corey Sandhagen and uh, Uma, Umar Nurmagomedov. So we're going to try to talk about that as well. Clearly, some of this will end up being bonus material. So I invite you to check out heavyhands.com slash Patreon if you want to hear whatever you don't end up hearing in the rest of this episode, where, by the way, Miguel Class and I will shortly be posting... Um, our second recap of this July sumo tournament, uh, which just concluded yesterday, I think. So there will be two little things coming out very shortly on the Heavy Hands Patreon. We appreciate your support. We hope you enjoy it over there. But next up, Tom Aspinall, Curtis Blades. We're going to talk about that after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Then welcome back to Heavy Hands, where we are now talking about another 
so-called title fight. Tom Aspinall, the fake heavyweight champion. <laughs> Free matched Curtis Blades. I don't know why I'm taking that tone. <laughs> Tom Aspinall. Only John Jones counts. You know how much I love John Jones. Mm-hmm. Tom Aspinall, Curtis Blades 2. That was the co-main event for the interim heavyweight title. I just feel like there is no such thing as defending an interim title. Uh, the moment no, you defend be. the moment you defend it, you're the champion. Sorry. Um, oh, I, I think John Jones should be allowed to just sit on his one win at heavyweight as long as he wants. I mean, it's coming up for two years now. Mm-hmm. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Remember when uh remember when uh Yuri Prochaska won the title? Yeah. And then remember when after him uh Jamal Hill won the title? And then both of them mm-hmm. like couldn't defend it for like three months and they were like, Well Yep. You better step down, well, son. It. Yeah. But John Jones gets to hold on to a belt for uh two <laughs> two years doing nothing. It's cool. Anyway, Tom Aspinall fought Curtis Blades. The fight lasted a minute. That's what every other Tom Aspinall fight has looked like, except the time he lost to Curtis Blades, where he couldn't make it to the end of the minute where he would have won because his knee exploded. What else is there to say? There is very little to say. Uh, except, as in the last section, the one thing that we should always be saying for this kind of stuff. Fuck you, Connor. Fuck me. A, you didn't believe in Bilal, remember the name Muhammad? And this time you were like, actually, we're getting to see this fight again, because now we're going to learn things about Tom Aspinall. No, we didn't. <sighs> didn't learn anything. Again. Yeah. I don't feel comfortable shouldering the blame for that one, but... I mean, what was the uh, statistic... That was posted on Twitter. Tom Aspinall's total career fight time with this performance. It reached what? 41 minutes, I think. This man has fought 18 times. And that has amounted to... I mean, 41 minutes almost seems long. Given yeah, how I mean, short... His, you would expect the number to be... There's one fight which is vastly uh, skewing his stats. Like, one or two fights. Yeah, there's a couple early that went into the second round as well. But really, it's like, yeah, the Arlovsky fight and the Volkov fight, which hilariously is skewing the numbers despite not even lasting four minutes. Because other than that, the vast majority of this man's fights do not even reach the second minute. Yep. Uh, So, yeah. That's uh, how to become a defending champion at heavyweight, is to be a huge guy who just knocks everyone out immediately. And I don't know. That's uh, it's very little to say. You're like, uh, what will he be like if he's extended? Don't know. Don't know. He has not done well in fights where he's been extended historically, but that can also just be put down to him being young and being fighting people who are bad and, you know, not being a professional and so on at that point. Um, it, you just don't know. It's just nothing to say. It's just It was poor Curtis Blades getting uh, dinged up with a 1-2. Yep. Looking fine on the feet, but yeah, just getting, getting Curtis Blades once again. Yep. Still just a sad story of a genuinely quite well-rounded and skilled heavyweight who just doesn't have the one thing which he needs, which is the ability to just tank damage. Yeah. Seriously, with that, Curtis Blades would be champion. If he could just, like, eat a shot like Mark Hunt, he'd be champion. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing missing, really. Like, you can point to a bunch of other stuff that's wrong in Curtis Blades' game, but none of it really sets him apart from the rest of the division. There's way more wrong with practically everybody else, including Tom Aspinall. Yep. Tom Aspinall also has some things going for him that Curtis Blades doesn't have. He has the incredible speed and power and explosiveness that Curtis Blades does not. But 
he's out there making a million mistakes a minute. Which is to say a million mistakes per fight. <laughs> he's, yes. Including in this one. I mean, literally, the same, it started exactly the same as their last fight. Yep. He just like blasts forward and just runs into a one, two from Curtis Blades, just directly into it. The only difference really is that he didn't do kicks. And therefore, I suppose, didn't re injure his knee. Other than that, this is precisely adaptations. how the Yeah, right. I always love when an adaptation is just pruning things away. <laughs> yep. I might just punch him in the face. Yeah. <laughs> So that was it. It was exactly the same as the last fight in how it started, except that Tom Aspinall did not get injured. And it barely went 30 seconds longer than that one anyway, because he then just touched Curtis Blades in the chin, and that was it. Some people were calling this an early stoppage. I I mean, I don't know. He got dropped. If you, if you watch Curtis Blades when he's being hit by those punches... He's not doing anything. You can see. But he's also, he's getting hit a bunch of times, and you can see he is going out on one strike. Like, it's happening very fast. You can see he is going out on one strike yeah. and waking up on the next. Yeah. Like, there's, there's like one point where he slumps straight down, and then suddenly, like, he jumps back up again. Like, I mean, I mean, jumps straight up, you know, he twitches back up again. He's still mm-hmm. stopped face down on the floor. And I'm just going to say, like, no. Like, no, just don't let that happen to people. No, 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 like, no. Like, don't, don't be like, oh yeah, this is the standard I want to set for how, uh, like much people should be beaten, especially at heavyweight. No. Like, it was a perfectly good you're... stoppage. He has a massive heavyweight fully pinning him from top position. He is not able to build any kind of base. Both hands are on the ground. He's not defending himself. It's a perfectly good stoppage. I do not need to see, like, Frank Mir versus Either Brock Lesnar or Shane Carwin again. Yeah, no. But it's just like, oh, yeah, he's he's definitely dead. Yep, yep. I would understand he's, Blades. He's unconscious now. I would perfectly understand Blades being frustrated by that. The fact that he's mm-hmm. the knockout stops basically, and then he's immediately able to sit up and look annoyed. But uh, he wasn't stopping it <laughs> while it was happening at all. Yeah, yeah. So, what are you going to do? Um, that's it. We have learned nothing about Tom Aspinall. Absolutely nothing. Once again. Zero. How many times have we said that? Okay. <laughs> on to the next fight. <laughs> that really is it, right? Uh, We're moving we on. To? Yeah. Oh, and I'm unfortunately, that, that brings us to... <sighs> Patty Pimblett. Bobby King Green. Now, actually, he should make Bobby... You know what he should do? He should make Bobby his new nickname. Mm. Should be King quotes Bobby Green. That would be good. Yeah. <laughs> so, King Bobby. Um, made himself a contender as many people... Well, I say that. More than the usual one guy. <laughs> it's always that guy, Ian, who's always like, this is a handy, that's a handy. This time, two or three people said, worse brain thinking. Immediately. A hundred percent. This is uh, top... maybe not a lock for it, because there's been some stupid people this yeah. year, but this is one hundred percent on the short list. It's a, it's a front runner for sure. It's a strong contender. Uh, so what happened in this fight, Phil? Tell me. Ex- explain. Paddy Pimblet big. Paddy Pimblet big. Bobby Green freaked out. Yeah. Bobby Green does something really stupid. The end. I mean, uh, oh, well, actually, sorry. Bobby Green, let's be fair. Bobby Green does something really stupid. Paddy Pimblet does some genuinely really cool grappling at the end. That's the thing you can never take away from Paddy Pimblet. He's mm-hmm. actually a very good grappler. At least in like being in top position, catching people in transitions. Um, you know, he's a good offensive grappler. We did watch him sort of get out grappled by Tony Ferguson in his last fight. Uh, at least at points, but yeah, he, that is, that is the one area where he will do things that are genuinely technically impressive. 
And uh, Bobby Green insisted he do those things by going for a takedown three minutes into the first round. Uh, I think where this ranks in the stupidest takedowns I've ever seen. Definitely up there. Yeah, huh? Uh, like what? McGregor Diaz. Uh... Mitrione, uh, was it Mitrione against, um, Rothwell was a personal favorite. Mmm. Literally the first takedown that Matt Mitrione has ever gone for in his MMA career. That's a good show. Directly into like a, a front, uh, like front headlock mm-hmm. guillotine. Um. But yeah, what? this was definitely one of the dumber ones because, yeah, I mean, you could see, you know, we mentioned this in the Jalen. And the uh, Jalen Turner fight is that Bobby Green very much likes being big and tall, so that he can like snipe at people yeah. from the outside and you know draw shots out of them and so on, and be in his effective range when his, the opponent is out of theirs. And uh, that was yeah, why Jalen Turner was a nightmare matchup for him, and why to a, some another extent, kind of Edson Barbosa was as well, because Edson Barbosa just kicks you to pieces at that kind of range. Yeah, and this was just. Uh, yeah, uh, Paddy Pimblet being massive and throwing big loopy shots and Bobby Green being like, oh, I don't, don't know if I like that. And they traded a bunch of low kicks and Green presumably thought he could get him with a takedown and, uh, he couldn't. But yeah, what made this obviously extremely stupid was not the takedown itself or anything about that, but well, it was, it was very silly. It was just the idea that like, you weren't there to beat him in the first round, Bobby. Yeah. Like. What are you so anxious about? That you, you, you immediately feel like you need to get out. That you need like a. Nothing was going horribly is wrong. This, is this man going to finish you on the feet? Right. Uh, Like it just. He was low just kicking him. I mean, that was pretty. In the first round. And then he is going to gas out horribly. <laughs> Yeah. Patty was low kicking him. I mean, it was, they were fairly effective. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of ways to solve that. Like, how about, he's not doing anything else. He's barely setting them up. So just try to get a read on the kicks. That's your goal in round one, Mr. Green. Get a read on those kicks so they stop being an issue. Check some of them. Catch some of them. Counterpunch some of them. Step out of the way until you feel comfortable doing any of those things. But it just made him yeah, so... Yeah, just, just make it out of round one. Just yeah. The exact kind of weird, panicky decision-making that you would not expect of a incredibly seasoned veteran like Bobby Green. Right. Yeah, I think, honestly, like, part of it, too, is that those low kicks are... They're literally the only thing Patty Pimblett's doing. I mean, this was an unbelievably inactive first round by Patty Pimblet standards. There was no popping mm-hmm. out of the trash can here. No. He was very, very passive and uh, insistent on maintaining that distance where apparently his plan was to just sort of kick Bobby in the legs every now and then. And I think oh, that... I mean, I guess it worked. Yeah, I mean, I think that also contributed to Bobby becoming so profoundly uncomfortable. But it's just bizarre. It's like... I've seen him go three round fights where he gets his legs chewed up, like the Barbosa one. Like, mm-hmm. and this is Patty Pimblet. It's not, he's not going to get better from here. And you are, you're Bobby Green. I, I do not, I don't know. At the stars aligned in some horrible, m- malicious way for, the, for this fight to play out the way it did. When, I, when it happened, I said, how, Long must I wait, Lord? Why? Are, why do you uh-huh. test me like this? Yeah, as I said, I haven't minded the the pimblet thing because I was so convinced that it would it would stop at some point, and because I'd been through it before with his cage warriors career. Yeah, I just come to my peace with the fact that he just wasn't very good, and I'd seen him, you know, lose fights and so on. And I was just like, you know what? He's never going to get that far. So whatever. But this. It's too far. Too far. He should have stopped here. It should have stopped here. He still... I don't need to... 
see him fight, I don't know. Hey, at least he, he made a real call Darren out. Hooker or Hanato. Oh, yeah, Hanato Moicano a, is a, it's a great call out. That's at least a competitive call out. I respect that. Mm-hmm. You know, and, to, and Bobby Green was a tough fight to take, too. So at the very least, that's one thing yeah, to yeah. take off of the reasons to hate Patty Pimblett list. Now it's mostly just him being annoying. <laughs> you know, I'll take yeah. that. If he's fighting good people, you know, fair and, enough. Uh, annoying but, and bad. Yeah. What horrible mistake is Hinato Moicano going to make? Oh, he's just going to do his thing where he just gets chin checked instantly. Oh my god. Imagine if Patty Pimblett knocks out. At a certain point, I'm just going to have to choose to start laughing. <laughs> I'm just going to have to choose to pretend that I'm enjoying it. Maybe I'll be able to convince myself. Yeah, uh, I might have to uh, resurrect my tweet where I was just like, uh, he was like first coming into the UFC where I was like, you know, now that Khabib's gone, there's clear a clear avenue for a powerful grappler and dangerous striker like Paddy Pimblett to mm-hmm. make it to the title. Just have to bring that one back. Now, there's really not much more to say than that. Another fight, yep. which is very yeah, short. We'll and... have to... Go on. We'll just have to get on the, on the Pimblett hype train now. Yep. Choo-choo. All aboard. Hmm. All right. Oh, Paddy the (laughs) Paddy. By the way, I thought uh, last time that he did um, the lions don't concern themselves with the the dreams of the sheep or whatever line. Um, I thought he was like sort of accidentally quoting Game of Thrones. When he did that, because it was just, it had just sort of entered the con. It's like him saying sweet summer child. Like nobody knows that that's like a Game of Thrones thing. It's become so ubiquitous. Uh But now he said he called himself the king of the north. So this man is still deliberately referencing Game of Thrones in 2024. (laughs) He hasn't gotten over it. I shudder to think, I shudder to think what might happen to him when he watches the final season. Cause I'm assuming he hasn't got there yet. <laughs> it's going to be hard for old Patty. Maybe that'll be, that, maybe that'll be uh, the thing that finally breaks him. Yeah. That forces him to move up to heavyweight. He just can't get the weight back off. Yeah. After he that. just goes, just goes on the, just binge eats. Chip shop bender. Due to how incredibly disappointed he is. Yeah. <laughs> okay well that's all there is to say about it uh let's take one more break when we come back um um more stuff i don't know if it's going to be uh sandhagen or Magomedov or if it's going to be the smattering of interesting results uh over the rest of this card but uh it'll be interesting after this financial support is fantastic but there are other even easier ways to support heavy hands Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. All right, let's talk about some uh, bantamweights. Men's bantamweights. Corey Sandhagen, Umar Nurmagomedov. They are booked to fight in the main event next week. In fact, before I even move on with breaking down this fight... I just want to remind you, Phil, that the co-main event of this card features uh, our features our new favorite fighter, Shara Bullet, a guy whose personality is as compelling and fun as his fighting style, uh, an e- an evil piece of shit who's also boring to watch. <laughs> it's sort of like a Greg Hardy situation. You know, where it's like, I'm used... Yep, he is the new Greg... He is the new Greg right? Hardy. Because I'm fully used to fighters being pieces of shit. Whatever. 
But if they're good, I'm not watching them for their, you know, domestic issues. I'm watching them in the cage. And uh, that was always the hardest thing to get over with Greg Hardy is like, uh, he's a piece of shit and he sucks. Why do I have yes, to keep watching he's him? Given, repeatedly given uh, spots that he absolutely did not deserve. And now we have Shara Bullet Magomedov, Shara Butin Magomedov, a uh, weird asshole who is afraid of sex. Um who is also very boring and only marginally good at one of the three phases available to an MMA fighter. And he is in the co-main event slot over Cheeto Vera versus Davis and Figueredo. Tony Ferguson insane. versus Michael Chiesa. Marginally less insane, but still insane. Mackenzie Dern versus Lupe Godinez absolutely relevant fighters in a way that Char fucking bullet is not. Yeah. He is And even like Joel Alvarez Elvis Brenner. That's a star is, action fight right there, if I've ever seen is, one. Yeah, that fight's gonna be fun as hell. Whereas this is them desperate like this is a, this co main event is them desperately hoping that what are they? Has really lost it because he's on a two fight. What are they smoking though? Why do they think they have something with Shara Bullet? He sucks. It's just, I don't know. It's just, you know, we just encounter these things where they just get stubborn about like a, a fighter that they think is like super relevant. He hits some social media metric or something that makes them rub their hands together. Um, yeah, Greg Hardy is the perfect comparison. Yeah, I just, Hopefully uh, Alex Ajak just rediscovers some of that, you know, body punching magic and just wrecks this idiot. Oleg Sajic is more than capable of beating him. Because the universe is cruel, he yeah. probably won't. He'll find a way to lose. But, um, yeah, it is just mystifying that there's this guy who, like, it must just be the look. That's got to be it. Like, they, that's how dumb the UFC matchmakers yeah. and Dana White are. They're like, this guy looks badass. This guy looks like I mean, he could be on a new metal album it's cover. On, it's people on, it's downstream of that. It's people online responding to the look. He is, you know, he is probably tweaking some, you know, they're, they are probably making hideous algorithmic decisions. It's that they're, they're yeah. seeing people who are like, oh, look at this guy. I bet you can find some, uh, YouTube videos just talking up how amazing he is out there, you know. Probably, some, like, some yeah. long thing about. The MMA goon is out there doing an hour and a half long video essay about where he like demonstrates 90 times that he doesn't even remember MMA fights older than three years. <laughs> and he's over there just, yeah, just glazing Shara Bullet Magomedov. Yeah, I'm sure it is something like that. He's, he's ticked some box or he's generated some kind of algorithmic interest, but. Uh, I, I'll say this. One thing I am looking forward to as, uh, his, uh, UFC career continues is, um, to hear the different combinations of commentators, uh, struggle and reluctantly have to come to terms with how shitty he is over the course of the fight. Cause this has happened. Well, Joe Rogan didn't really seem to pick up on it <laughs> in his debut. But last time out against Tricoli, a terrible fighter to not be able to even remotely dominate. Um, I think it was like DC and Bisping. That was the one in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, it was really funny to listen to them sort of just have to confront how poorly <laughs> Magomedov was doing <laughs> throughout the entire fight and not really being able to explain his decision making. So that'll be fun. Yep. Anyway. Yeah, I'm going to, and I'm just going to enjoy him losing to someone who isn't very good, frankly. Well, that's what you think. As much as the, uh, as much as the, like, Greg Hardy experience was, was grim. It was always delicious. It, I did enjoy, always delicious to see him lose. It was very enjoyable. Yeah. 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 Him losing to, who was it again? Um, well, multiple people. Main I think, event. Was it Mark? Well, it was, it was the. 
Marcin. Uh, main event fighter. What's his name? My, Marcin Tybura, yes. Yeah. Upcoming main event fighter, Marcin Tybura. Watching him get bullied by Marcin was pretty satisfying. <laughs> so, maybe Oleg Sajic... We, you need to watch the domestic violence guy because he's a, uh, because actually, you know, he's a hyper athlete from, from American football. Yeah. Like, we're just lucky to have someone yeah. with this degree of athlete and you just get to watch him get TKO'd by an overgrown hobbit. By a, <laughs> yes. <laughs> by a flabby neckbeard. Yeah. <laughs> so. Maybe it will be Oleg Sajuk, maybe not, but it seems written in the stars that uh, Shara Bullet's uh, hype train cannot long survive even the middleweight division. He's been so unimpressive in both of his UFC fights, like more so than Patty Pimblett. Oh, yeah. He hasn't even generated that kind of like, oh, you better watch out for this guy. He just sucks. So anyway, mm-hmm. the main event, it's Corey Sandhagen. Versus Umar Nurmagomedov. And uh, of course, there's a lot of other stuff that we just mentioned on this car, but we're going to have to wait till next week to talk about it, or we'll be here all damn day. The main event, though, Sandhagen, Nurmagomedov. What do you think? Uh, A super tough one. Yeah. Uh, Mainly because we don't know enough about Umar Nurmagomedov. Yes. He has surprised Um, me a few times. Yeah. Uh, he seems just, like we said, he's got, he's got like a super janky, uh, striking, uh, like, striking game. What's it actually? It's construction. How did he beat? Well, like against uh, Tony Barcelos, he was jab man. He was Southpaw jab man. He just jabbed him to pieces, like off the back foot. Um. Yeah. Which was very impressive. I had never actually seen him really get enough time. Well, I had seen him be like, uh, I, I just thought he was one of the, uh, one of the Dagestani Nurmagomedov guys who happened to be like a weird kicker. You yeah. know, like Saeed. Um, but it turns out he actually had like a pretty basic but very effective boxing game to complement that. <laughs> that was one of the first surprises when I realized there's more depth to his striking than I initially uh, realized. Other than that, though, he just uh, he is capable of absolutely crushing everybody on the ground. Yeah. So I mean, he's a real, real like lead side southpaw. Yeah. Like fights like he's a converted southpaw. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a lot of a lot of jab and a lot of like. Front side push kicks. Mm-hmm. A very, yeah, unique range controlling game. Um, on the other hand, um, it's, it, you just can't pick him over Corey Sandhagen, right? No, 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 no. You just haven't seen the level of competition. Uh, he just hasn't fought anyone like Sandhagen. Sandhagen is one of those very few people who can be considered in the same sort of vein as a, uh, Bilal, remember the name Ahmed? Yes, absolutely. As someone who is completely willing to change his game plan on a dime and execute it yep. for the opponent who's in front of him. And who is very, you know, vocal about his, how much he thinks about, how much he thinks about fights and how much he prepares for opponents and how that has shown itself in increasingly impressive performances. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing you so yeah, have I mean, you to know, consider I'll... though is, uh, the actual number of dominating wrestler grapplers that Sandhagen has fought. Not exactly mm-hmm. the main thing that Bantamweight is known for. I would love to have a, uh, Marab Duwalish Willie fight to study, you know, to know what to really expect here. He did, um, Deal with TJ Dillashaw's wrestling quite well. But Dillashaw yep. has, Dillashaw is rarely really that interested in control. He did not deal with Aljamain Sterling well at all. Instantly got taken down, got his back taken, 
got choked out within a minute and a half. That kind of thing, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like Nurmagomedov does not have, um, Aljo's tendency of coming out super hot at the start of every fight, which I think was part of that. Sandhagen just did not have time to settle in, but it is certainly the main loss to a grappler that uh, sticks out in my mind. It's hard to forget about that. When you look at uh, how Nurmagomedov has effortlessly controlled every other person he's ever gotten to grapple with. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess for me, the main question is what do Umar Nurmagomedov's strike, uh, takedown entries look like? Hmm. Because, uh, you know, uh, the, in the worst case, the worst thing he could be in this scenario is that he could be a Luke, he could be a Luke Rockhold. Because, you know, some of his, you know, the Barcelos performance is, is very, is a very impressive, uh, like, striking, strike, striking performance. He knocks him out and so on and so forth and dictates the range with his jab and so on. But like, how much is he doing that every time out? And how much are people then closing into the clinch to try and get past, like, the kicking range? Yeah. How much is he actively pressuring and enforcing takedown entries? Not is he, much. Like Aljamain Sterling, does he have a control over space in the cage where he's forcing people backwards and then hitting takedowns on them? No. Um, again, there might be one of his fights that I'm missing where he does this, but he seems closer to a Luke Rockhold than a Khabib or a Bilal or an Aljo. Yeah. I mean, I think most favorably you could compare him to Islam, who also likes um, to maintain distance and hit reactive shots, which, mm-hmm. from what I can recall, is mostly what Umar likes to hit people with. And in fact, he got in yeah. trouble uh, for his lackluster form on his level changes very early in his last fight against uh, Bexad Almakan, who just clipped yeah. him like behind the ear with a wild right hand because this is the thing Umar really like bends his back and looks at the floor when he is either trying to get under a strike or changing levels to get to a double. And uh yeah, he got nailed for doing that. I think that is his main way into the grappling is getting people to reach for him and ducking under. And he's got the timing, which makes it harder to punish the, uh, the fact that he's, he's not exactly doing this correctly. But all the same, he's not doing it correctly. And he is in there against somebody who does not have to overcommit to get to him. Yeah, that's the other thing. Like, you're going to hit reactive shots or reactive anythings. On Corey Sandhagen, who is both huge and very diverse and, uh, you know, and very diligent about setting his shots up. Yes. You know, he's going to work his way in behind feints. He's going to hit the body, going to change levels in his strikes. And you are (laughs) never going to be sure of what he is committing to. And he's going to do it from miles away because he's a giant. Yeah, in fact, I think he's been increasingly effective at fighting from long range. Sandhagen um, used to be a lot more, it used to be a lot more predictable that he would try to like get into the pocket with everybody and fight tall. But I think mm-hmm. his footwork, his jab, uh, have both allowed him to be a much more effective long fighter uh, over the last few years. Yep. So... Unless he runs into some kind of unexpected issue where Nurmagomedov's kicks are very effective, like, would not surprise me if this is a fight where Nurmagomedov suddenly becomes heavily interested in low kicks, trying to break Sandhagen down. It just seems like it's a pretty long leap of the imagination from what I've seen uh, up to this point. To then Umar being really consistently like attritive at long range to the extent that Sandhagen has to make mistakes uh-huh. and has to overcommit. So I think you can probably expect a pretty controlled 
and controlling range performance from Corey Sandhagen to kind of neutralize the strongest parts of Nurmagomedov's game while slowly racking up damage uh, from a distance where he simply is just has a much better feel and a much wider array of uh, of options. That would be my my pick. Yeah. I've got to give credit to Corey for taking this fight as I did the first time they tried to book it. Oh, I forgot, he yeah. really should be fighting for the belt. He should. Uh, Marab should have just fought. And now Corey should be next in line. Yes. And we never should have had Cheeto fighting for it at all. We are getting O'Malley and... Marab now. I mean, they did finally make that. And yeah, one of the things that makes it so difficult to pick Umar in this is simply that he is, you know, he he's on the fringes of the top ten. Yeah. And has leapt up the division. So yeah, credit to... Corey for like taking on a dangerous threat. Yeah. Uh, when he probably didn't have to. But yeah, he, you can't not think that he just can be too much for him at this stage. Yeah. Yep. That is my expectation. Uh, it's a trap fight for Corey for sure. No question. But, uh-huh. uh, it's also one where it should be the last win he needs before he gets a shot at the title. So. I mean, um, you hope so, right? You hope so. Yeah. I mean, God forbid that something crazy happens in O'Malley, Duelish Willie, which I suppose seems likely, and they make an immediate rematch of that. But Corey Sandhagen, like, this is the only problem with a division as good and stacked as Bantamweight, is that you get these, like, also ran figures just promulgating everywhere. People who really should be getting shots and, like, there's just too much of a log jam, uh, at the top of the division for them to get through in a timely manner. I mean, how old is Corey Sandhagen now? 32? Wow. You know, if he's not champ soon, mm-hmm. then uh, he's he's probably not uh, got a lot of time left at bantamweight. Yep. It's an unforgiving division. Yeah. Even without the fuckery. No question. All right. So as I uh, mentioned before, uh, Happening elsewhere on this card, aside from the scandalous co-main event, Cheeto Vera returns from his unearned title shot against Sean O'Malley to fight Davis and Figueredo. That sounds awesome. Tony Ferguson versus Michael Chiesa sounds very, very sad, but it's probably the one of the less punishing fights they could give Tony Ferguson. It's not Michael Chandler again, so I'll give him credit for that, I guess. Mackenzie Dern yeah, versus... Well done. Yeah, good job, Mick. Congrats, Mick, for this Tony Ferguson matchup. Yeah. That's what I feel. Yeah. I fight a welterweight <laughs> grappler. <laughs> Why do you even think of that? This is up at welterweight. What is happening? This is actually a horrible idea. Why did that not even cross my mind? Oh, it's fine. Hopefully, hopefully Chiesa won't just be like, now is the time to flex my striking. And he'll just mercifully tap him out immediately. That would be nice. Um, Mackenzie Dern versus Lupe Godinez. A cool women's strawweight fight, which should be crazy and fun. And then opening the main card, Howell Alvarez, Elves Brenner, is a certified banger. I mean, the only reason uh, I didn't immediately jump on your suggestion that that could also be a better co-main event, which it could, it is the platonic ideal of a main card opener fight Mm -hmm. this is the place for a gangbusters action matchup like that it's a it's a very strong main card uh for a fight night card which uh would be explained by the fact that it's not happening at the apex so we're gonna have a, a lot of fun talking about whatever crazy shit goes down next week uh, when we will also be looking forward to, is there anything the week after? There sure is. Never a break. Mar- mm. <laughs> Marching to Boris Sergei Spivak. Okay, so next week we will be talking exclusively about the Sandhagen Nurmagomedov card, and it'll be fun. Uh, until well. <laughs> Until then, I will remind you once again to check out the Heavy Hands Patreon for a bunch of uh, fight breakdowns that you did not hear on the uh, rest of this episode and also to listen to part two of Miguel Class 
and me breaking down the July Grand Sumo Tournament, which uh, we talked about halfway through. We'll see how the uh, rest of the results ended up surprising us or not uh, when we uh, revisit and look at the whole tournament in full. That's Heavy Hanka on the Heavy Hands Patreon, patreon.com slash heavy hands. Otherwise, find Phil and I on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson. That's Phil at Boxing Bush. That's me. And until next week, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. <laughs>